Good morning. Welcome back. To Good to have you here today. Uh, it's a little warmer today than it was last week at this time. But uh, it's good to be back out here on the deck in the sun, as you can see from my uh, squinting in my face. Um, now, I need to start with, I don't know, it, it, sort of an explanation, especially for those of you who may have been thinking over the past couple of weeks, Dan, where are you guys? We have not seen you um, at our local church. Well, here's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, a couple of weeks ago on Friday, this son right here called us to say that he had COVID and was coming home which quarantined us for approximately a week. And uh, so that was the first Sunday that you guys didn't see us, and nobody in our church saw us. Then, the next weekend, we had to go to this school to see this son play in several performances, a co couple of concerts that were just absolutely fabulous, and they were great, and it was a, an amazing um, uh, opportunity to see him play. Uh, we had a great time, but that took the weekend as well. So that was this. And now this coming weekend, in fact, this very day today, May 2nd, we are off to watch this son graduate from this school. So, in case you're wondering where we are, that's our story and we're sticking to it. But, I'm here today to talk about May 2nd and the things that happened on this date. Because there's a lot of really fun stuff that happened on this date. In 1526, the German evangelical monarchs joined the Schmalkaldic League. The Schmalkaldic League. Now, this was not an early baseball league, okay? The Schmalkaldic League was a league of German uh, Lutheran ministers in what was then called the Holy Roman Empire. So, at first, they got together for religious reasons to support the, uh, the, the, the rise of Lutheranism and Protestantism against the Catholics. But later it became a political thing where they started having battles and then there was the Schmalkaldic Wars and all kinds of stuff. So this is one of the ramifications of the Reformation that had started just nine years previously. On this date in 1536, Anne Boleyn is executed. Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, um, he's, she's the one that uh, he divorced Catherine of Aragon to marry. Um, and she was executed on this date in 1536 at the, the Tower of London. We have been to the spot where this took place. Um, and then he went on to marry four other women as well. So, uh, but it was on this date. In 1776, France and Spain agreed to give guns and weapon, weapons and materiel to the American colonies in their fight against Britain. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing that the American Revolution, we, you know, those of us in the United States tend to think of us being that that was the center of the universe. But in fact, the American Revolution, what we call the American Revolution, was in fact just a smaller part of a much bigger geopolitical struggle at the time between French, between the French, the Spanish, the English, and several other countries on the uh, European continent. Um, if you've seen Hamilton, uh, you know, one of the songs uh, involving him and George III, he says something about, you cheat with the French, and now I'm fighting on two fronts. And this is, uh, came to fruition on this date in 1776. <clears throat> on this date in 1908, the song Take Me Out to the Ball Game was registered as a copyright. And uh, so now what that means is every time you sing that, somebody is paying somebody something to be able to sing root 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 for the home team in speaking of baseball <clears throat> in 1909 pittsburgh shortstop honus wagner steals his way around the bases okay so what that means is he he gets to first base and i don't know how he got there walk a hit whatever he stole second then he stole third then he stole home in the first inning of a game against who the chicago cubs so, um, Honus Wagner, nicknamed the Flying Dutchman, incidentally a baseball card, a rookie baseball card of Honus Wagner, uh, sold in 2016 for over $3 million. So, let's all have a moment of silence for those of us who collected baseball cards and had boxes of them, and they somehow or other disappeared as we got into older ages. So, uh, yeah, $3 million for a baseball card. And that is not the most expensive baseball card. 
Okay, just just saying, that is not the most expensive baseball card. Three million. In 1926, the U.S. military intervened in Nicaragua for the second time. And so the Marines this time were going into Nicaragua, and there's a medal for the U.S. second Nicaraguan invasion. Uh, once again, illustrating the U.S.'s uh, the U.S.'s desire to intervene in uh, other countries' matters. Back to baseball. <clears throat> In 1939, Lou Gehrig uh, ended his 2,130 game streak today, uh, on this date in, in 1939. And the, he, he stepped out of the lineup, and the Yankees won without him 22-2 to that day. They beat the Detroit Tigers. So, uh, but it was on this day that, that that streak ended. And in 2008, this is the day that the movie Iron Man was released. Now, some of you may not realize this, but Iron Man was the start of a huge thing. And this is significant because, number one, our family has been enamored with a, these movies. And we're re-watching them. But they, they, there's like two dozen of these films now that they've all tied together in an amazing, very clever way. But it all started on this date in 2008 when the movie Iron Man was released. Birthdays on this date include, in 1892, Manfred von Richthofen, uh, better known as the Red Baron, was born. Richthofen was a uh, German flyer um, known for flying a Fokker triplane, a red Fokker triplane. He, he had his own squadron. They were called the Flying Circus, and he painted his plane red. Here's an illustration of it, although that's not the actual plane because it was shot down. Uh, tradition says it was shot down by a Canadian. Uh, I believe I should have looked this up, but his name was, I believe, was Roy Brown, a Canadian who shot him down. Uh, Richthofen had 80 uh, victories in the air and was the most uh, celebrated, or I should say, he had the record for the most kills in World War I uh, with 80. In 1925, Roscoe Lee Brown was born. African-American actor Roscoe Lee Brown. He died in 2007. Great actor. We've seen him in a lot of things. In fact, Debbie and I went to see him in a play at the Goodman Theater, one of August Wilson's plays. So we made a point of going out to see Roscoe Lee Brown in a play. Finally, on this date in 373, one of my personal heroes in the faith, Athanasius of Alexandria, died. Athanasius, his uh, nickname was Athanasius Contramundum, uh, better it's translated means Athanasius against the world, and one of the things I like about Athanasius, he was he was ex, he was excommunicated not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, five times. This guy was excommunicated five times and came back every time. Uh, very significant in the life of the church. In fact, Athanasius is the first major religious figure to have published the list of the New Testament books that we have today. So in other words, in the fourth century, Athanasius every year would send a letter out, every like around Christmas, he'd say, here, here's the year. And uh, he was the first one to say, these 27 books, Matthew through Revelation, are the inspired books of the Bible. Okay, he died on this date in 373 AD. All right. Well, with that, let's get back into Ephesians. Now, I think today will be a little bit shorter because we just have to finish up the book. Um, but we're going to finish up the book of Ephesians today. So, let's get back to that. Welcome back. It's good to have you here as we finish the book of Ephesians, uh, the last chapter. And I, I think, I think this is going to be kind of a shorter lesson today. Um, but I've said that before and it turned out to be very long. So again, I'm keep that in mind. Uh, okay. So we talked last week about the household codes, that, uh, series of instructions that Paul was giving to various assembly persons within, uh, households, children, slaves, wives, um, and then we, we talked about how those are all encompassed under the idea of this is what the body of Christ should look like. It should include all of these different elements. 
the one element was submit yourselves one to another. So that is, you know, believer to believer, Jew to Greek, male to female, husband to wife, wife to husband. Okay, so there is a mutual submission element involved there. Um, and in, in slaves as well. Uh, and again, it, it, it was questionable. Why doesn't Saul, I'm sorry, why doesn't Paul just condemn slavery? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but he says that those of you who are in a, a slave situation, you should obey your, your masters. And he tells masters, you should treat your slaves like brothers. Um, and then the one suggestion was that if a Christian did in fact follow these instructions, there would be no slavery because they would not be able to do that. Okay, so it's a tough question and one that I can't I, I can't really take the time or, or don't have the ability to take the time and kind of solve right now. But again, it, he, he's looking at this this mystery of unity, this this uh, what happens when the Jews and the Gentiles switch their uh, religious affiliations, for lack of a better way to put it, and become one. So they're no longer Jews, they're no longer Gentiles. So they both sides give up something, but both sides keep their fundamental elements of, of their own existence okay so how they get together this this unity that comes together is is something that's that's very critical um, and it's something that that to this day in 2021 we're still kind of figuring out how do we get along when we put different people groups together and different uh, organization or not organizations but you know different different races and different genders you know how, how do we how do we get together how do we uh, where do we draw the line kind of stuff? And so Paul says for this situation here, this is this is how you're going to do it. And it's going to bring glory to to God. And that's kind of the whole point on, on why he's doing this. And so so now in, in Ephesians chapter six, beginning with verse 10, we have Paul's great conclusion. OK, Paul's great conclusion. And that is he's, he's going to bring it in and he's going to say, OK, here's here's the thing. OK, now. Keep in mind, this is Paul's rhetorical finish to the to the book. Okay, so I say that because as we get into the armor of God, we don't want to get too hung up on the metaphor. Okay, so um, and and I'll I'll touch base back on this here in a few minutes when we, when we get to it. But uh, we're going to begin today with Ephesians uh, chapter four. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter six, beginning with verse ten. Where Paul says, finally be, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Okay. Now, in his mighty power goes back to a phrase in the first chapter where he talks about, he's thanking God about the, how his mighty power. In fact, let's just, uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 19, Paul says, I'm going to find it here. Paul says, um, He's thinking, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And then verse 19, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. And so now in verse chapter 6, he's come back to this discussion of power. He said, be strong in that power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Okay, so um, in, in, in this is this is again this is Paul's big big conclusion. So this is Paul's big conclusion here. So finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Okay. Now, when he says be strong, 
Now, there's a tricky, in fact, there's a tricky element to all of this in, in looking at the, the Greek. And I'm not a Greek scholar, so I don't, I don't, and I don't play one on TV. But as I understand it, and this is based on the discussions and the various commentaries I've read on this, um, there, there's, the, the idea of be strong could be taken in a passive way. What that means is this. The way it's written in the NIV, where it says be strong, that is an imperative. An imperative is a verb tense where somebody is using a verb to tell you something to do. So, for example, the word run means, you know, and, and when we're talking about running, okay, it says run, I'm running. But if I look at you and say run, then you know that that's in a direction. That is a, something that you need to do. It is imperative that you do it. Okay, so it, that's that's the imperative sense. And so when we talk about those, these are verbs that are used as like commands. Be strong, run. Okay, um, th those are those are our imperative commands. But there's also a passive element to this. And what that a passive verb is as opposed to an active verb. So uh, if I say I hit the ball. Okay, so I'm the subject. Hit is the verb. Ball is the object. That's an active verb. But if I say passive, the ball hit me, or I was hit by the ball, meaning the subject and the object, the object is doing, you know, so you've got this, you see the difference here? The object is doing the damage to the subject. But how it matters here is another way to look at this particular passage is rather than say, be strong, and that's fine. Again, as there's, there's justification for that. But another way to look at this is Paul is saying you are being made strong okay and and what that suggests is that these gifts or not gifts isn't the right word I mean it is a good word but it's not the right vocabulary um, the these elements of armor that Paul is about to talk about are things that we already have we already have access to Okay, just by virtue of being one of the children of God. And, and Paul is like, take advantage of these. Be strong in these. They're, they're already on you. And this has to do with, you know, put on and the heiress participles and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but, the, you know, you already have this. You already have access to all of this. Okay, this is not something, okay, okay today I'm going to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, no, it's like, it's already there. You just need to Take advantage of it. Remember back to our discussion of being filled with the Spirit. What did that What did that mean? That sometimes it was just an awareness of the power of the Spirit within you. And I think Paul is just kind of saying, look, at the end, just be aware of, of the power that you have within you, the power that, that God has given us by virtue of being his, his children. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Side note, keep in mind, this is written to a church. Okay, this is written to a community. So Paul is telling the community, put on the whole armor of God. Okay, not necessarily an individual. Now, can an individual, can I stand, look at this and say, oh yeah, I need to do this, I need to do this. Yes, but Paul's direct focus here is on the community. That is the community that is the church, the body of Christ, that is going to be putting on this armor, that is going to be taking on uh, the, you know, the, the prince, you know, principalities and powers and all that stuff. Okay. So again, there's a both end. I can, again, there's an individual element to it. Yeah, this is something I can do. But Paul's point here is it's the community that's doing this. Okay. So if somebody is, is, is preaching this text, it says, Paul is giving this so that you can be equipped. Uh, you kind of you're, you're really pushing the text at that point. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Okay, so be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay. Now, interesting, this is the only place in the New Testament where this kind of language is used, where it talked about this, this heavenly battle. But again, Paul has talked about all of the things that God has done for us in the heavenlies. And so he, he, is, he has been hinting about this heavenly, nature, this, this heavenly battle that's going on. 
And, and I think one of the things he wants to make clear is that I know it's very easy for us in the midst of our own life and in the midst of our own trying to live out our, our beliefs to say, okay, our battle is with that guy over there or with that woman over there or with this here. And, and it really isn't. Paul is saying, listen, this is much bigger than that. This is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Okay. Now, Prior to about World War II, there was kind of a shift in interpretation of this passage. This side note, you know, we, we like to think that the way we look at the Bible today or, or the interpretation that we bring to the Scripture today is the same as it's been since the days of Athanasius. It's not really true, okay? Interpretation, analysis, application has changed over the decades, okay? And prior to World War II... This particular passage tended to be focused on what you would think it is, spiritual forces of darkness, all of the different things. Whereas after World War II, there tended to be a, a trend toward an analyzing this verse and say, oh, well, this applies to political systems and, you know, like communism, you know, and socialism and all that kind of stuff, okay? So this was an interpretation that, oh, well, you need to put on and fight against these forces of the devil, Okay, so the, these these spiritual forces of evil, the powers of this dark world, these these godless philosophies. Okay, now I'm not suggesting that those are not don't fall within that, but I think that was one way that we allowed our our own culture, and I'm talking about white evangelical Western Christianity, allowed its situation to kind of change the interpretation of Bible verses. Okay, now, does that mean that these, like communism or any of these things are are not tools of the devil? No, it doesn't. But then again, capitalism can be a tool of the devil as well. Okay, so we really want to kind of focus on what Paul is, is talking about, and that, and that is these, 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 these wiles of the devil, these, these, these uh, forces that are coming in that are going to destroy what? What is Paul's big deal? <clears throat> He's talking about Ephesians. That is the unity of the church. These things that are coming in that are going to affect the unity of the church. Okay. So, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay. Well, he, he talks about these. The flesh and blood against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay. Now, again, Paul is in his, Paul is in his conclusion mode. Okay. Paul is in his final statement mode. Okay. He, he is not making a, a ranking, okay? He is not making a, a list and saying, okay, this one, okay, he's not saying that, that uh, uh, where am I? The rulers are, are one, but authorities are even worse, and then the powers of this dark world are even worse. That There isn't a ranking element going on here, okay? The, Paul is just saying, look, all of these are examples of the spiritual forces that we are battling against, okay? And, it, it, and, and I think the point is, it isn't just that guy across the street or that woman over there or that guy on the TV or that guy on Facebook, okay? No, it's, just, it's much bigger. And so we need to focus on the big picture here. Okay? Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, okay? So... Emphasis here on this day of evil. What is what is he talking about? And, and why do you need to be prepared for this day of evil? Oh, well, I think one clear reason you need to be, because evil itself, you know, doesn't really, isn't as clear as we think it is. I mean, Snodgrass points out that evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its purpose. I'm in a class right now, I'm going to mention this a couple more times here, but I think before I'm done, I'm in a class right now where we're kind of looking at especially uh, missions involvement and the U.S. involvement in, in colonialism and things like that over the past 500 years and what missionaries did and how they approached their work. And it made perfect sense at the time. And I, and I think what they were doing made perfect sense at the time. But in looking back, we could say, well, wait a minute, there are some real problems with that. You know, two, three, four hundred years later, it's easy to look back and go, whoa, 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 that, that, that's not, that was not the way to do that. Okay. Um, so, so it's, but at the time it looked right. And so Paul is saying here, you know, if, if, if the body is equipped, 
If the body is equipped, they'll be able to see the evil at the time. Okay, when when it comes. Okay, so uh, therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Now, again, I mentioned it earlier. Don't get too hung up on the metaphor. Don't get too hung up on the on the symbolism here. Okay, because Paul, like in First Thessalonians five, uses slightly different phrases for these things. Okay. Now, Paul, again, this is not something new to Paul. Let me read a couple of passages from, from Isaiah. I'm going to start with Isaiah before we get into the details of this. And we start thinking, wow, where did Paul put all of this together? What was his source material? Well, I'm going to look at four passages. Real, I'm going to just read them real quick. And then we're going to go on and talk about them. You'll kind of see where Paul get, get these from. Because remember, Paul's a Pharisee. Paul is somebody who knew the Old Testament. He knew the Hebrew Scriptures. So these things would have would have uh, come to the top of his head real quick. So in Isaiah 11, let's see, Isaiah 11, 5. Uh, let's see. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Okay, belt of righteousness. Isaiah 49, uh, let's see, Isaiah 49, 2 says, He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Okay. Um, Isaiah 52, 7. Oops, went a little too far there. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. As far as talking about feet and righteousness and peace and all that. Uh, and finally, in Isaiah 59, 17, Paul, uh, Isaiah says, where is it here? He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. So Paul doesn't talk about the, you know, doesn't bring out the garment of vengeance. Okay, but the, these, these, Images that Paul is using are are drawn mostly from the Old Testament. He's, he's, he's bringing them together to say, look, here, these are the elements of faith that you already have. Take advantage of them. Okay. Put on the full armor of God, verse 13, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. And after you have done everything, meaning got it all set up, to stand. Stand firm there then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place. Okay, again, there's that Isaiah 59, 17. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Okay, so Isaiah 52. Right there, again, I read that earlier. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, now, if you've been in the church for any length of time like I have, you have heard a number of sermons talking about this. And again, Paul is, is don't get hung up on the imagery. Okay, so for and what I mean by that is, is there are some people who have said that, you know, have gone through this, the imagery, and I've, I've heard this sermon, they've gone through the imagery, they describe all, all it is, and they will point out that, there's nothing covering the back in this in this in, in these images and so therefore this is not you're not supposed to run okay now yeah you're not supposed to run i get it but you know you're going beyond the text there you're, you're looking you're focusing on the imagery when paul is just looking these are all tools that you have and he's using them in an, in a way that they will understand that the readers will understand them is this that this picture of an armored person they understand how how that would work together and that would all together that person is equipped for a battle because it is a battle so being being this mystery of unity does not come easily okay unity is not something that is just going to fall into your lap this ability to go from uh, where a jew and, and a gentile can sit together at the table of brotherhood and 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 bond with each other Okay, over Christ. Okay, that's not going to come easily. That's not going to come without a fight. And the evil one is is not going to just say, oh, okay, well, I guess they got it. You know, 
Paul said, you got to be ready for this, okay? After all I've talked about, the mystery, all of the that God has done for us in 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 his, uh, the position we have in the heavenlies and all of the practical theology that we've talked about, finally do this because it is a battle in the heavenlies, okay? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, okay? <clears throat> And there's a possible reference to um, Isaiah 11 here as well. I don't think I mentioned that one. Uh, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, side note, you know, when Paul talks about the word of the word of God, he's talking about one of two things, okay? He's, he's almost certainly referring to the Hebrew Bible. He's not talking about the New Testament, okay? Now, this is not a diheretic moment. I'm not saying the New Testament is not a uh, the Word of God. I'm just saying when Paul wrote it, he's referring to the Old Testament. Okay, we look back and we look at the the, the circumstances, and we say, okay, these are there are 27 additional books that are inspired. Athanasius knew it. These are the Word of God. Okay, but let's keep straight with what Paul is talking about here. Okay, he's talking about the Old Testament. Okay. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The other thing he could be talking about, he could, well, there's two other things, okay? He could be talking about simply God speaking, whatever God says, okay? Just because, you know, Paul had been caught up together in the third heaven, and, and you know, in one of his passages, he talks about that. So Paul had communed directly with God. Paul had had God speak directly to him, Okay. Um, and so maybe he's talking about that, or he could be talking about in the beginning was the word and the words were with God and the word was God, Jesus. Okay. Embracing Jesus here. Okay. But finally in verse 18, he says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Okay. Now, is this a, another piece of equipment? Probably not. It doesn't fit with the structure, but he says like above all, pray okay and and prayer is that communing with god it's like recognizing the higher power as you deal with these fights that are going on these these attacks against the unity of the church these attacks against the body of christ with this in mind be alert and keep on praying for all the lord's people okay not just the jews that are in ephesus but the Jews that are in, and, and, and the Jews in the, and, and the Gentiles that are in Ephesus, but the believers that are in Jerusalem, the believers that are in um, Antioch, the believers that are in, you know, uh, Laodicea, okay? Pray for all of these believers, okay? Because the body is, is one. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Okay, so Paul reminds them, hey, by the way, guys, I'm in prison. So as you're praying for others, pray for me. Because Paul recognizes that he's going to have opportunities to speak in unique circumstances, in unique situations. He's going to be able to speak to people that most believers at that time are not going to be able to speak to these the judges and rulers and people that are in in exalted places okay and he says pray for me because i know this is coming pray for me pray that i may declare it fearlessly as i should okay so paul is not asking for prayer to give him wisdom on what to do he already knows what he's supposed to do he's just asking for prayer for the strength to do what he knows he already should do Okay. Paul wraps it up here in a couple of verses that are very similar to pass, uh, a passage at the end of Colossians. Um, he says, beginning with verse 21, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Now, who is Tychicus? He's mentioned several times in the, in the five, four or five times in the New Testament. Companion of Paul, um, in this situation, he's probably the letter carrier. Okay, so there was in the Roman days there was a postal, what we would call a postal system, but more often than not, it was just if you knew somebody was going there, you would give him or her a letter and say, "Here, take this," and then the letter would say, "Tychicus is a good guy. Don't you know? 
feed him before you send him home and all that. And so that's Tychicus's role here. Tychicus, a dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything. He'll kind of fill in the blanks for you as far as what I'm up to, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, so that you can pray for me, as he talked about in a few verses before. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. Okay, so there's something about Tychicus is that he's going to be an encouragement. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. This is a benediction that Paul gives to say, you know, grace and peace to those who are reading this. Okay, grace and peace to, to those. Well, I guess he doesn't say peace. Well, no, he does say peace. Peace and grace, I guess, would be the correct order. So peace and grace to those who are reading this. Okay, and that's it. We're done with Ephesians. Okay, Paul's letter extolling the, the virtues of the mystery of unity, that you guys have accomplished something that is amazing. This body of believers has accomplished something that, that is amazing. They have taken former Jews and former Gentiles and put them together in one. They have created a sense of unity that is amazing to the world. There are still threats, and he gives specific instructions. Here's how to deal with these threats. Here's, here's how to be a witness in, in the world that we live in, in this time and in this place. Here's how you should act. But you know what? Take a step back. It's a bigger issue. It's a battle against principalities, against powers. Okay? Things to keep in mind as, as you uh, go on. So, that's it. That's it for Paul. Next week, I'm going to start something new. I'm going to start the book of Isaiah. And my working title on this is going to be Isaiah, the Proto-Gospel. Because Isaiah is quoted more in the Gospels than any other of the prophets. And there are so many passages in Isaiah that we quote on a regular basis. Now, I'm not going to go verse by verse through Isaiah because it's 66, verse, 66 chapters. And uh, in order for me to get through that, it would take me probably two or three years at the rate I go. Um, so I'm going to try and really cut it down. Um, and so we're going to talk about Isaiah. We're going to talk about the major, the mega passages. Isaiah 6, 53, 40, all these different, 55, all these different passages and kind of talk about what they're what what Isaiah is all about what an Old Testament prophet is all about so next week we're going to kind of do an overview of Isaiah we may touch on a couple of the passages um, and then the second week we'll, we'll probably jump right to Isaiah's call which is in Isaiah 6 because again that's a passage that's talked about quite a bit so again thank you very much for being with me I appreciate your time and uh, if you have any questions let me know Just send me an email Put it on the Facebook page, comment on the YouTube, and uh, we will talk to you next time.